And joining me now via Zoom, they are the directors of the new documentary, Lost Angel, The Genius of Judy Sill, Mr. Andy Brown and Mr. Brian Lindstrom. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us. It's great to have you. Uh, I saw the documentary. Well done. Very well done. I enjoyed it immensely. Thank you. Didn't look like the easiest documentary to make, and I want to kind of get into that. But first, I, I think uh, I want to give people a little bit of background. So can you tell us who was Judy Sill and why haven't we heard of her? Well, Judy was, a, was the first artist signed to Asylum Records, which was David Geffen's label. Um, she uh, made two albums for Asylum and a posthumous album that she recorded with her friends in uh, the mid 70s. She died of an OD in 79. Her records were out of print for many, many years. Uh, were reissued in the early 2000s. So she started gaining a newer audience. Um, she's arguably more well-known now than she was in her lifetime. Um, there was no obituary that appeared when she died uh, in LA in her hometown. So she was pretty much lost in obscurity. Um, we did not, you know, we're not responsible for people knowing who Judy Sill is. Uh, we hope we increase that and make people aware of her, but um, she has a, a nice audience, a cult following, let's say now. Um, but uh, a lot of the work that was done in terms of how we went to make the film was in a, a booklet that was accompanied the posthumous release called Dreams Come True that had interviews with many of her friends and colleagues. And we used that as our blueprint of when we started of who we were going to interview. And that's how we began. 10 years ago, at least at this point. How, I'm sorry, how many years ago? It took, it took 10 years to make the film. So we, in December, 2013, we started interviews. Wow. Yeah. That, that's a commitment guys. Uh, I definitely applaud you for that. What was it about her in particular that you, that struck you as being special? Well, it started for me with the KISS video on Old Grey Whistle Test. Well, it started earlier where I'd heard about her, but uh, that really was had the most effect on me. And then I showed it to Brian uh, soon afterwards. So, and it had the same effect on him. This is before, obviously before we considered doing a documentary and then Brian, do you? Well, you know, I think what really drew me was just the, the power of her music and then the kind of unexpected life story. And at first glance, it, it seems like completely opposite. How, how could that person contain both those things? And yet the more we delved into it and the more we found out about Judy, it made perfect sense. You know, like it, as she says in the film, she was doing those holdups as a teenager just to try to feel something, you know, and, you know, the, the childhood abuse that she suffered at the hands of her stepfather just had profound impacts on her life and her kind of heroic struggle to make sense of that and to share her music, her healing music with the world was just something we really wanted to, to tell. And to do it in her own voice, if we could, as much as possible. That was the puzzle we tried to solve from the beginning. And that's partly why it took so long, because we had to get all the archival material that was out there, which was not much, but included an audio cassette of an interview she gave in 72, where she told her whole life story. And then we got possession of her journals and drawings that sort of covered 73 to 79 up to when she died. And we were able to create a voiceover out of that, that a voiceover actress does. And so that was Judy's voice telling the story. And the drawings served as the uh, template aesthetically for the animation. And the score is almost exclusively the multi-tracks from Heart Food, her second album. So she's scoring the film as well. So that was that took a while to accumulate all that stuff so that we could have Judy tell her own story. And we got lucky, too, in terms of finding the, the right material to do it. There's an incredible amount of archival, and you have some interviews as well of people who are no longer alive. The fact that you're starting out with a subject who isn't around to tell her story uh, is incredibly challenging. And I really like the way you guys dealt with that. And I kept thinking, just from a filmmaker's perspective, like, God, this must have taken forever to make. This must it have did. been like, what was the initial reaction when you started approaching? Because you got some you know, like big names. Like you guys sit down with David Geffen. I'm sure he's not the easiest guy to get on the phone. Um, what were the initial reactions when you said, hey, we want to make a doc about Judy Sill? Gratitude. 
Yeah, gratitude and support. Like, that's a great idea. How can we help? Pretty much everyone. And you're right about when, when we first started, our, our goal was to get as many of the people um, of Judy's circle interviewed because they're they're older. And so we have a in memoriam section in the film because we started the film so long ago and people have passed who we've interviewed who are in the film. There's a bunch of people. So we needed to get that, you know, uh, group filmed as quickly as possible. Um, and fortunately we did. Was there any one bit that was particularly challenging or any one person that was particularly challenging to to get or to open up about this? Because everybody from her generation seems pretty open about her. They seem incredibly frank because it, it seems like that's the way she was, you know, mm -hmm. like very yeah. much in that spirit. But was there anybody that was like, oh, we're never going to get this guy. And then you actually got the guy. I guess Geffen, right, in a way. Tell, yeah. tell the story. Yeah, tell the story, Brian. We, we knew we really wanted to interview David Geffen, of course, because he was the first person to sign Judy. You know, he must have seen that talent. Um, Plus, he was blamed for the destruction of her career in Wikipedia. So. And we were lucky enough to interview Jackson Brown. And Jackson uh, took it upon himself to basically recruit David Geffen for the film. And so we got an interview with David and uh, it was transformative. And what was so um, powerful is that after the interview, uh, David kind of gently touched me on the arm and said, please get my relationship with Judy right because she meant the world to me. Yeah, because there's a lot of this uh, legend that you're kind of combating with him. You know, she camped out on his lawn. She harassed him. She insulted him on stage, like all of these different things. And he's like, no, no, no. you know, he, he kind of, he tries to set the, the record straight, but then, you know, as a viewer, you do kind of wonder, well, is, is his account true or is he just trying to make himself sound better? Cause you know, this is David Geffen we're talking about. He's one of the most powerful people in the industry. I think we're leaving it up to the viewer to decide cause we don't know either. I think there's some truth to both. I think she did probably say something. He perhaps pulled some of the publicity and doesn't remember or isn't being honest about that. I don't know. But I think as I, you might hear my voice in the film say to JD, I think she had made this album heart food that was just beautiful. And the response to it was, it was sort of ignored. It sold less than the first album and it was devastating to her. And in some ways, I think psychologically, it was easier for her to blame what she had done and said about Geffen than that people, that the public was ignoring her album. But I will tell you this, that in the journals that we found, there's not one mention of David Geffen in there. And she just wrote about her life and there's a lot she wrote about. She didn't say anything one way or the other about him. So make it that what you will. I mean, of course, you have a lot of these great musicians talking about her, like J.D. Souther. And you guys got Linda Ronstadt, too. Was that also archival? Because she doesn't do interviews. She doesn't do appearances at all. Right. We, we did that one via the phone and it was uh, such a treat to talk to her for an hour and and. Her generosity and, and love for Judy, you know, was just really inspiring. Yeah, and we were lucky that we did it at a time right before she stopped giving interviews. So, um, but she was wonderful and and she's just so smart. And it's a shame that, that you know, she can't, isn't able, I guess, to speak because she just has so many, her mind is so sharp. It has nothing to do with her mind. So, but yeah, we're lucky. We were very lucky to get her. One of my favorite parts of the film is when Linda says, uh, you know, if Linda, or if Judy were alive today, I, you know, I, I hope we'd be friends. I always really <laughs> Yeah, I did love that too. You guys are about to release the film. Uh, it's coming out soon, but have you had a chance to see it with an audience yet? And what was the reaction that you got? We have. We saw it at Doc NYC in 2022 in November. Uh, and it was just so gratifying to basically have that wonderful physical sensation in a in an auditorium of the audience responding to Judy. It was surreal. I had never seen it projected until that moment either. So that was just fabulous, you know, just to see it on a big screen and a nice system and sounded great. Yeah. It was, it was, I'll never forget that. And we like we were fortunate people responded well to it and we 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 actually I would toot our own horn a little here, but we won we won a, a festival in England called Dock and Roll, and Judy was 
huge. I mean, not huge, but her. I wasn't surprised that we won because I knew how popular sh she was and how rabid her small fan base of England was. And so, you know, that was that was terrific. I I was so we were just so grateful, you know, to that that it went off. Just just that we that a sense that the Judy fans liked the movie. I think in some ways was the most gratifying has been the most gratifying part of this. What was the impact that you felt it had on the audience? What impact do you want it to have on audiences on for people who knew her and, and probably more so for the people who like me, who had not heard of her before this? Well, I think it brings a lot of new people to Judy's music and also obviously to her life. Um, and I think the people that already know Judy probably have a deeper appreciation of the challenges she faced. And also of the uh, the incredible fortitude that she had and how she never stopped writing music. You know, she, three days before her death, she was writing a new song. Yeah, and this idea of perseverance through suffering, despite the fact that she herself did not make it, she had a disease of addiction and that was proved more powerful, but she never gave up. She was writing songs to the very end. She did not want to die. She did not commit suicide, I believe. It, the idea of dying as an OD terrified her. So, you know, but like Brian said, you know, it's just, she 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 didn't have the tools at her disposal that people would have now, let's say, you know, in recovery. Uh, she did go to rehab a couple of times, but it just was not the same um, support system, um, sadly. It's a very, uh, I think it's a very impactful movie. And, and I think you guys, uh, it's, it, I think it's told with a lot of love too. Like you can see that from the people you interview and, and from the way uh, people talk about her and the way it's depicted, the animation's beautiful. Like you guys made a really beautiful movie. Um, for people who want to know more about you, know about the film, where they can find it, et cetera, where can they find you guys? Uh, at Judy Sill Doc uh, is the Instagram is that's, always updated and we're on facebook i don't what's our facebook uh lost angel the genius of judy sill and on twitter at judy sill doc we've got the movie premiering as well it's going to be out in theaters yes it'll be in new york and la and san francisco and well, new york and la is playing at next starting on the 12th there's some other theaters as well but it starts streaming on apple and and amazon that day as well april 12th <laughs>